NASA's state of the art. James Webb Space Telescope has astounded scientists once again with a groundbreaking discovery. As the telescope peered back in time to see the early days of the universe that Hubble never could, it captured the deepest and sharpest infrared images of the distant universe so far, showing us the universe as we've never seen it before. But when we zoomed in on the glorious sights that James Webb kept revealing, we found something so unexpected that it actually created problems for science. It calls the whole picture of early galaxy formation into question. In other words, James Webb's deep field image is shattering our physics. It requires a fundamental shift in our understanding of how the universe came to be. Something is wrong. We may have to revise our theory of the creation of the universe. Join us as we dig deep into how James Webb is upending our understanding of early galaxies. What was the universe like at the cosmic dawn? That poetic phrase is what astronomers call the time just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang when the very first stars switched on, flooding the cosmos with light. To see this era, we'd need a time machine, and astoundingly, we have one. We have many, actually, telescopes. Light travels very quickly, at the speed of a billion kilometers per hour. But still, galaxies are so far away that it takes their light millions or even billions of years to reach us. The farther they are from Earth, the longer it takes for their light to reach us. So, in a sense, when we glimpse their far-flung photons, we see backward through time to observe these ancient galaxies as they were long ago. The light from galaxies at the cosmic dawn has been traveling for more than 13 billion years, attenuated across the vast distance which has grown all the while as the universe expands. That light arrives to us not only exceedingly faint, but also very redshifted meaning that its once optical wavelengths have stretched out into the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, gathering enough of it to do cutting-edge science, let alone make pretty pictures, requires a huge telescope that is keenly sensitive to any infrared glow. This is precisely why astronomers built the James Webb Space Telescope with its huge 6.5-meter segmented mirror and multiple infrared-attuned instruments, it can see galaxies as they were not too long after the first stars were born, and possibly maybe even all the way back to the cosmic dawn. To push the limits of Webb's capabilities, astronomers designed a special observing program called the James Webb Space Telescope Advanced Deep Extragalactic Survey, or JDs for short. It looks at a very small area in the sky for long periods of time to get deep field images of the vastly remote objects across the universe from Earth. And now researchers are leveraging the success of that project in James Webb's first year in space. A carefully selected subsection of that area is now the target of the JD's origins field, which in the telescope's current sophomore year will push the observations even deeper into the universe hopefully taking the measure of galaxies closer to the cosmic dawn. The program has already returned riches from those almost unfathomable depths, and you can see and explore them for yourself, all from the cozy comfort of your desk or anywhere else you might use your smartphone. A mosaic of the observations so far is available online. When first displayed, it looks like a patchy, irregular black field dotted with smudges, but if you zoom in and in and in, you'll find that the brightest objects are glorious galaxies. Many of them are recognizable as spirals, but most, by far, are more irregular in shape. A similar galactic bestiary populates the magnificent Hubble Deep Fields, earlier images from the Hubble Space Telescope that revealed smaller fragments of galaxies apparently in the act of merging to form the larger galaxies we see today. A scattering of stars in our own galaxy can be distinguished here and there in the Jadez field. Each of them stands out from objects far more distant via its very sharp point-like appearance, as well as the presence of diffraction spikes. 
three pairs of lines that radiate away from a star's center and are caused by the bending of light around the hexagonal one-meter mirror segments that make up Webb's primary mirror. Close inspection also shows a faint horizontal line bisecting each Milky Way star, which is caused by light bending around a support strut of the telescope's secondary mirror. However, if you look very carefully, you'll even find some far distant fuzzy objects with very bright cores that also display diffraction spikes, such as Object 1 69604. These objects are likely active galaxies, each harboring a central supermassive black hole that is eagerly and sloppily eating huge amounts of gas and dust. This material heats up viciously and blasts out radiation as it spirals to its doom at a hefty fraction of the speed of light before finally vanishing across the black hole's event horizon, the ultimate point of no return. In fact, one hope for the JD's origins field is to find distant galaxies where these gargantuan black holes are just getting their start. One of the biggest mysteries in cosmology is how these black holes grow to be behemoths with a billion times the sun's mass in less than a billion years. Many of the astronomical objects in this mosaic can be identified by their color, that is, how bright they appear at different wavelengths. The near-infrared camera, James Webb's workhorse instrument, has filters that select for different wavelengths, several of which are used by jades. You can switch the display between filters by clicking the top Layers icon in the upper right corner of the Mosaic's web page to see how appearances change when you change what flavor of light is observed. The distribution of light across colors is called the Spectral Energy Distribution, or SED, and the bottom Layers icon has an option to show this. Astronomers use the SED to determine what kind of object they're seeing and, for galaxies, the approximate distance. Poking around the image, we found plenty of odd objects to ogle. For example, Object 196582 is clearly some sort of galaxy that is likely more than 7 billion light-years away. But it has a fuzzy, oval-shaped arc stretching above it. Sometimes the gravity of a massive galaxy can bend the light from more distant background galaxies, warping them into unusual shapes in a process called gravitational lensing. But those arcs are usually sharply defined and thin, and this is clearly not. Another possibility is a galactic disruption. Galaxies sometimes pass close to each other as they fly through space, distorting and twisting from their gravitational interplay and pulling out streamers of stars like cosmic strands of stretched taffy. If one galaxy is much smaller than the other, it can be totally torn apart. That could be what we're seeing here. There are also less extreme encounters. Objects 171522 and 171523 are a pair of interacting galaxies that seem to be roughly equal in size, and each is distorting the other. After enough time, it's possible this duo will physically merge, becoming a single, larger galaxy. Many such examples of galaxy collisions can be found in the mosaic adding to our understanding of how galaxies interacted and grew in the universe's early days. The most amazing thing about this image probably isn't any specific object, but rather the sheer number of objects that James Webb captures in the entire JDES field. Astronomers have counted on the order of 100,000 galaxies there, yet it covers only a tiny fraction of the sky appearing about the same size as would a piece of very fine gravel on your fingertip held out at arm's length. Extrapolated across the entire sky, this means that the heavens above hold hundreds of billions of galaxies, which is comparable to previous estimates. The depths of the JD's origins field will reveal greater numbers of them still, giving us more to study and more precise measurements of them as well. It's a powerful reinforcement of a staggering fact the universe is positively brimming with galaxies. Our Milky Way is just one of them, and were we to look at it with James Webb from 10 billion light years away, it would be just another among the teeming throng, like those in the Jadez field. It's humbling, certainly, 
but it's also a source of joy and even pride. We can grasp this fact. Through science, driven by our ever-hungry curiosity and ever more powerful technology, we can know our true place in the universe and even bring its most distant depths to our fingertips. But when James Webb is filling the gaps in our understanding of cosmos, it also discovers the impossibles. The unexpected findings then call the whole picture of early galaxy formation into question. For much of the universe's history, there appears to be a consistent correlation between the number of stars a galaxy has formed and the quantity of heavy elements it has produced. But for the first time, we now see signs that this relation between the amount of stars and elements does not hold for the earliest galaxies. The reason is likely that these galaxies simply are in the process of being created and have not yet had the time to create the heavy elements. The universe is teeming with galaxies, immense collections of stars and gas. And as we peer deep into the cosmos, we see them near and far. Because the light has spent more time reaching us, the farther away a galaxy is, we are essentially looking back through time, allowing us to construct a visual narrative of their evolution throughout the history of the universe. Observations have shown us that galaxies through the last 12 billion years, that is, five-sixths of the age of the universe, have been living their life in a form of equilibrium. There appears to be a fundamental, tight relation between on one hand how many stars they have formed, and on the other hand how many heavy elements they have formed. In this context, heavy elements means everything heavier than hydrogen and helium. This relation makes sense because the universe consisted originally only of these two lightest elements. All heavier elements, such as carbon, oxygen, and iron, were created later by the stars. The very first galaxies should therefore be unpolluted by heavy elements. But until recently, we haven't been able to look so far back in time. In addition to being far away, the reason is that the longer light travels through space, the redder it becomes. For the most distant galaxies, you have to look all the way into the infrared part of the spectrum, and only with the launch of James Webb did we have a telescope big and sensitive enough to see so far. And the Space Telescope did not disappoint. Several has James Webb broken its own record for the most distant galaxy. And now it finally seems that we are reaching the epoch where some of the very first galaxies were created. In a new study, published today in the scientific journal Nature Astronomy, a team of astronomers from the Danish Research Center, Cosmic Dawn Center at the Niels Bohr Institute and the Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen, has discovered what seems indeed to be some of the very first galaxies which are still in the process of being formed. Until recently, it has been near impossible to study how the first galaxies were formed in the early universe since we simply haven't had the adequate instrumentation. This has now changed completely with the launch of James Webb, says Caspar Elm Heinz, leader of the study and assistant professor at the Cosmic Dawn Center. The relationship between the total stellar mass of the galaxy and the amount of heavy elements is a bit more complex than that. How fast the galaxy produces new stars also has something to say. But if you correct for that, you get a beautiful linear relationship. The more massive the galaxy, the more heavy elements. But this relation is now being challenged by the latest observations. As Caspar Elm Heinz says, when we analyzed the light from 16 of these first galaxies, we saw that they had significantly less heavy elements compared to what you'd expect from their stellar masses and the amount of new stars they produced. In fact, the galaxies turned out to have, on average, four times less amounts of heavy elements than in the later universe. These results are in stark contrast to the current model where galaxies evolve in a form of equilibrium throughout most of the history of the universe. The result is not entirely surprising, though. Theoretical models of galaxy formation, based on detailed computer programs, do predict something similar. But now, we've seen it. 
The explanation, as proposed by the authors in the article, is simply that we are witnessing galaxies in the process of being created. Gravity has gathered the first clumps of gas which have begun to form stars. If the galaxies then lived their lives undisturbed, the stars would quickly enrich them with heavy elements. But in between the galaxies at that time were large amounts of fresh, unpolluted gas streaming down to the galaxies faster than the stars can keep up. The result gives us the first insight into the earliest stages of galaxy formation which appear to be more intimately connected with the gas in between the galaxies than we thought. This is one of the first James Webb observations on this topic, so we're still waiting to see what the larger, more comprehensive observations that are currently being carried out can tell us. There is no doubt that we will shortly have a much clearer understanding of how galaxies and the first structures began their formation during the first billion years after the Big Bang, Caspar Elm Heinz concludes. While unlocking the secrets of the early universe, James Webb also is living up to its hype, pushing forward our search for life in other worlds. Recently, the Webb telescope has just detected methane and water vapor in the atmosphere of a Jupiter-like world located around 163 light-years away. Astronomers made the discovery by using this powerful infrared space telescope to watch the extrasolar planet or exoplanet WASP-80b pass by the face of its parent red dwarf star, which it orbits roughly once every three Earth days. Astronomers have spotted water vapor in the atmospheres of around a dozen planets thus far, but the detection of methane, though commonly found in the atmospheres of solar system worlds like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, using space-based spectroscopy has been far rarer. That is what the team, including Arizona State University scientists Lewis Wellbanks and Michael Line of the School of Earth and Space Exploration, and Bay Area Environmental Research Institute researcher Taylor Bell have now done with the James Webb Space Telescope. This was the first time we had seen such an obvious methane spectral feature with our eyes in a transiting exoplanet spectrum, not too much unlike what could be seen in the spectra of the solar system giant planets a half a century ago, Wellbank said in a statement. To be clear, this isn't the first time the Webb Telescope has discovered atmospheric methane for instance, the observatory discovered such molecules around exoplanet K-1218b earlier this year. WASP-80b is classed as a warm Jupiter because it isn't as close to its parent star as so-called hot Jupiters are, but is still closer than so-called cold Jupiters. The original Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system and the gas giant that gives this category of planets their names, is technically a cold Jupiter. Due to this relative proximity, distinguishing WASP-80b from its red dwarf star is no mean feat. In fact, it's even the capabilities of the $10 billion time machine. It's the equivalent of spotting a single human hair from a distance of 9 miles or 14.5 kilometers away. Fortunately, astronomers have a way to tackle the challenge. They basically wait for WASP-80b to transit the face of the red dwarf it orbits then observe a collective spectrum associated with the planet. Because chemical elements and molecules absorb light at characteristic wavelengths, looking at the combined spectra and comparing it to the star's solo spectra reveals distinctive fingerprints of specific molecules in a planet's atmosphere. According to Wellbanks, using the transit method, we observed the system when the planet moved in front of its star from our perspective causing the starlight we see to dim a bit. It's kind of like when someone passes in front of a lamp and the light dims. During this time, a thin ring of the planet's atmosphere around the planet's day-night boundary is lit up by the star, and at certain colors of light where the molecules in the planet's atmosphere absorb light, the atmosphere looks thicker and blocks more starlight, causing a deeper dimming compared with other wavelengths where the atmosphere appears transparent. This method helps scientists like us understand what the planet's atmosphere is made of by seeing which colors of light are being blocked. 
But the team didn't stop there. The scientists used another method to measure the atmosphere of WASP-80b too. Like all planets, WASP-80b emits some of its light in the form of thermal radiation. Both the wavelength category and intensity of this light are dependent on the temperature of the planet. This proximity of WASP-80b to its star gives the planet a surface temperature of 1,025 degrees Fahrenheit, or 552 degrees Celsius. This is in comparison to typical hot Jupiter temperatures of 2,150 degrees Fahrenheit, or 1,177 degrees Celsius, and the positively frigid temperatures of our Jupiter at minus 235 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 148 degrees Celsius. Warm and hot Jupiters are also tidally locked to their stars, meaning they have hotter permanent day sides that always face the star, and permanent cooler night sides that always face out into space. Just before WASP-80b eclipses its star, its day side is pointed toward Earth, meaning measuring a dip in light coming from the star during the eclipse reveals infrared light coming from the planet as a result of its thermal emissions. This gives astronomers eclipse spectra with light absorption patterns connected to molecules in a planet's atmosphere. These patterns sort of appear as a reduction in the planet's emitted light at specific wavelengths. Combining the eclipse and transit data allowed the team to see how much light was both blocked and emitted by the atmosphere of WASP-80b at different wavelengths. Then, the researchers used two different models to simulate what the atmosphere of a planet like WASP-80b would look like under the extreme conditions of a warm Jupiter. One model was strict, accounting for existing physics and chemistry to determine the levels of methane and water that can be expected from such a world. The other model was more flexible, trying millions of different combinations of methane and water abundances and temperatures to find the recipe that best fits the data. Comparing transit and eclipse data to both models led the team to the same clear conclusion. They had definitely detected methane in the atmosphere of WASP-80b. As Line explained, before the James Webb Space Telescope, methane had remained largely undetected despite expectations that it could have been detected with the Hubble Space Telescope in planets where it should have been abundant. These lack of detections generated a flurry of ideas ranging from the intrinsic depletion of carbon to its photochemical destruction to the mixing of deep methane-depleted gas. The next step is to explore what the chemical composition of WASP-80b can tell scientists about the exoplanet's features, formation history, and evolution as they pertain to methane and water abundances. Such studies would allow the team to infer things like the ratio of atmospheric carbon to oxygen too. This ratio is something that varies based on precisely where a planet forms around a star. It could reveal if WASP-80bi formed where it now sits, or if it was born further out before migrating toward its star. The team will also compare the atmospheres of warm Jupiters outside the solar system to those of planets orbiting the Sun, harnessing samples and data collected by space missions that have already visited Jupiter and Saturn. Not only is methane an important gas in tracing atmospheric composition and chemistry in giant planets, but it is also hypothesized to be, in combination with oxygen, a possible signature of biology. Wellbanks concluded, One of the key goals of the Habitable Worlds Observatory, the next NASA flagship mission after James Webb and Roman, is to look for gases like oxygen and methane in Earth, like planets around Sun, like stars. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.